In 2001, the flow of international human rights politics overwhelmingly largely went in one direction. Uh, human rights mobilizations, initiatives, priorities, you know, all were almost exclusively originating from Western governments, NGOs, and universities. Um, and almost universally, they were focused outward, right, to the Middle East, Africa, other non-Western contexts. Um, and so the focus was, you know, frequently on women's rights, religious freedoms, and other kind of rights that could be attributed to backwards religious or cultural traditions, uh, and not violations that really implicated the West or Western geopolitics. So the American response to 9-11 uh, began the process of kind of disrupting this human rights geography. There was now a spotlight on American human rights violations. You know, Yemeni human rights activists held conferences on Guantanamo um, and American torture and denial of due process uh, in their newspapers. They would opine on them, um, you know, pass judgment on them. Kuwait kind of funded what was essentially a veiled human rights campaign aimed at, at the US. Um, and then with the Arab uprisings, Middle Eastern voices and activists emerged really, I think for the first time at the fore of kind of defining and promoting human rights in the Middle East. Um, and although the uprisings, as we know, have taken a very dark turn, that at the very least that has endured. Traditionally, Americans ascribed to the view pr pretty broadly um, across the board to the view that the US was the world's model for rights and freedom in the world. Um, so they could inspire or teach others, but there was no good reason for the international human rights framework to be applied to them. So when Evelgrave and Guantanamo and ex extraordinary renditions come to light, um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, something that was unthinkable that the U.S. could commit real human rights violation became, you know, a reality. And even though uh, many Americans kind of justified it and the terrorists were pretty successfully, you know, dehumanized through labels of being, you know, uniformly being terrorists or misogynists, you know, violating women's rights, um, still uh, these events kind of put a dent um, in, in this American human rights narrative. Um, so the rights mobilizations of the Trump presidency, you know, protests around the Muslim ban early on, the Me Too movement early on, um, you know, challenges to the separation of the migrant children, um, Black Lives Matter for, matters for sure, uh, you know, as well as kind of the emergence of political figures who started referring to healthcare as a human right, um, uh, or at least, you know, their emergence onto the, the mainstream, or water, the right to clean water as a human right. You know, all of this um, kind of flows from, you know, after 9-11, this realization that human rights may have something uh, that is relevant to Americans, both in terms of their foreign policy, but also domestically. So the prevailing kind of, you know, assumption um, in the West was that the Middle Eastern populations you know, rejected human rights based on cultural and, and religious reservations, and that they had to be persuaded of the merits of human rights. And I think, you know, a lot of my research is around, you know, how much that <laughs> assumption misses really um, in the whole much more complicated picture. So when Middle Eastern populations saw the images of Abu Ghraib, their reaction was one that I have often heard um, in the region of, you know, what human rights? Human rights do not ex do, don't exist. They're just an illusion. Um, and, you know, in saying this, they're not rejecting human rights. They're actually lamenting what they understand as this kind of internationally sanctioned moral discourse being corrupted and, and co-opted by the powerful.